Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to lead off with Werner Franz, who died recently at the age of 92, and he was the last surviving crew member of the Hindenburg disaster. Franz was a 14-year-old cabin boy on the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg was the German Zeppelin that was designed for transatlantic travel in the mid-1930s. It actually made 34 transatlantic crossings in 1936. Built by the Nazis, it flew from Germany to both North and South America. It would land at Lakehurst, New Jersey when it flew to the United States. 1936, remember, were only nine years after Lindbergh had made the first transatlantic flight, and there was no real transatlantic aircraft travel then. You still had to travel from Europe to the United States by ocean liner, and the Hindenburg was considerably faster. It could make the trip in about a day and a half. It was a true luxury ship. The Nazis used it for propaganda. They flew it over the Olympics in 1936, and the only problem with it was that it flew with hydrogen. Helium was much more scarce, much more expensive, and had some military value that the Germans could not have ready access to, so they used hydrogen, and hydrogen was flammable. On the first transatlantic crossing of 1937, on May 6, the Hindenburg was preparing to land at Lakehurst, New Jersey, when the unthinkable happened. No one knows exactly what was responsible, whether it was an electromagnetic spark, a cigarette, there are conspiracy theories about sabotage. But as the Hindenburg prepared to land, you're one of the most famous radio broadcasts of the 20th century by Herb Morrison, based here in WLS in Chicago, reporting from Lakehurst. Note how he keeps his composure and tells his tape man to keep the tape running as he reports what he thought would be an uneventful Zeppelin landing that turned out to be, in his words, one of the worst catastrophes in the world. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. They backed motors with the ship, but just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's right, and it's rising. It's rising terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks are saying that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's like running. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are speeding around it. I told you, I can't even talk to people that are around there. It's, 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 uh, oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laid down mass and smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. I, I, I Listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because they, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Oh, the humanity, famous call. My dad actually saw it flying over Manhattan. You could see it flying over Manhattan. He saw it flying over Manhattan that day, but he didn't see the actual crash because it was in New Jersey. Here's Werner Franz from the Smithsonian Network describing his experience as a cabin boy that day and how he survived. Werner Franz, the cabin boy, was on his fifth trip. I was 14 years old. This was an amazing experience. I had just finished school with no job and feeling downhearted. And then something like this happens. It was like a gift from heaven. When I first walked into the hangar, I couldn't see the airship. It had filled the hangar entirely. The ship had ja die the the halle vollkommen ausgefüllt. It is 245 meters long, but it's only nine meters short of the Titanic. She's covered in 34,100 square meters of canvas. I stood in front of what I thought was a gray wall. It took a while before I actually realized that I was standing in front of the ship. The start of the catastrophe came out of the blue. There was a sudden jerk through the entire ship. Then I heard the explosion. It was clear to me that the ship was lost. I needed to find a way out. Then a shower of water hit me. One of the water tanks had burst open over my head. This drenched me from head to toe and possibly helped me think clearly. I reached the hatch and I kicked through the hatch. Then I saw the ground coming towards me. 
I didn't run straight away, but I turned around and ran the other way, slipping through underneath the ship onto the other side. This was a good decision, because the wind was pressing the flames towards the right side, and I probably would have run into the flames. But I escaped, and I ran to the other side, where most of the survivors jumped off as well. No one could speak, least of all me. I was crying until Chief Stuart Kubis came over to me and put his arm around my shoulders. He said, come on, pull yourself together. Go and see if you can help anyone. So I ran back to the ship, but of course there was nothing I could do to help. From what I experienced there, my escape was like a heavenly gift. I must say, I learned to appreciate things more, more intensely than before. I realized how quickly everything can come to an end. And I was grateful for everything that I was allowed to experience after that. Of the 97 people on the Hindenburg, 35 died and one person was killed on the ground. We're going to move on now to Wing Commander Kenneth Rees, who died recently at the age of 93. He was one of the British prisoners in Stalag Luft III in Silesia, who was captured during World War II and he participated in The Great Escape, which was made into the famous 1963 movie. Some people say the Steve McQueen character Hiltz patterned after him, but here in a BBC interview, Commander Rees tells us that that wasn't true. Survivors of The Great Escape, meeting for one of their final reunions 10 years ago. Among them, Ken Rees. Originally from Ruabon near Wrexham, the former airman had been living in Rosniger on Anglesey. Ken Rees had been a farmer before joining up as a bomber pilot. He flew more than 50 missions before being shot down over Norway in 1942. Three of us survived and uh, managed to get to the shore, and two were killed. In walked what appeared to be three quarters of the German army, a mixture of Gestapo and Luftwaffe. They announced the usual thing for you, the war is over, they said. We were prisoners from then on. Ken ended up in the notorious Stalag Luft III camp. He played a central role in the legendary tunnel escape from there in 1944. Part of the reason he was recruited is because his colleagues thought that, as a Welshman, he must have known something about mining. He's also said to have been the inspiration for Steve McQueen's character, Cooler King Hilt, in the film The Great Escape. But he himself wasn't convinced. He's tall and I'm not, and he, I'm heavier than he is. <laughs> and uh, he's an American and I'm a Welshman. The only thing in common, really, was the both annoyed the Germans and we both finished off doing stretches in the cooler. That is all. I mean, I didn't get out and if I did, I wouldn't have been able to ride a motorbike anyway. 76 men got out of the camp, but only three made it home. 50 were shot following a direct order from Hitler himself. Ken was luckier. He was halfway down the tunnel when it was discovered and he had to scramble back. 70 years on, the deeds of Ken Reese and his colleagues still resonate. But that pride is tinged with sadness as another war hero passes on. Give up your hopeless attempts to escape. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits. Meanwhile, we dig. I had to play a little coda there from The Great Escape. That was Richard Attenborough, by the way, with podcasts we just did recently. We can move on now to Bruce Morton, who died recently at the age of 83. He was a political correspondent for over five decades. He was primarily known for his commentary. He was a great writer. He made his name at CBS where he covered the memorable campaigns of the 1970s, the 1972, 76, and 1980 presidential campaigns, and he moved on to CNN where he did a commentary. Here's CBS on the death of Bruce Morton. Longtime CBS News and CNN correspondent Bruce Morton died today of cancer. Bruce was one of the best writers in the business. We learned a lot from him. Most of all, he liked writing about politics. On a good day, he said, Politics can be more fun than cards. Bruce covered conventions, elections, wars at Watergate, and won a Peabody Award as co-anchor of the CBS Morning News. The citation said he made getting up every morning worthwhile. Wolf Blitzer did a piece on Bruce Morton for CNN. He made it a little too much about himself, but it was a nice tribute. A personal word about a loss to the CNN family and indeed to all of journalism. The former CNN national correspondent Bruce Morton died yesterday. He was 83. Bruce worked for CBS as well, covering everything from the Vietnam War to Watergate. He especially loved politics. He was in Iowa in 1976 when a little-known Southerner made it a mandatory first stop 
or would-be presidents. This is a good state for a man who can spend time on organization. That may help, for instance, former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. I worked uh, with Bruce uh, every week uh, when I uh, anchored CNN's late edition, The Last Word in Sunday Talk. It's easy to look around America and think that it works pretty well. We're all somewhat free, though blacks are not as free as whites even decades after legal segregation ended. Still, we have some freedom, some optimism, some hope, some reason to think we can rise in the world. He wrote so beautifully. Uh, it was a perfect way to end late edition every single Sunday. I loved hearing uh, his essays and what he had to report. Something I said when Bruce uh, retired back in 2006 still holds true to this day. His voice, I said, was unique. It was smart. It was wry with a perspective you could only get by covering politics for five decades. As one of our colleagues said, uh, if there were a journalist hall of fame, Bruce Morton certainly would be in it. You can see how journalism has changed. The irony is that it'd be hard to imagine Bruce Morton inserting himself into a commentary like Wolf Blitzer just did. On that theme, here was a documentary called The Boys on the Bus, which was about political reporting of presidential campaigns and the reporters who traveled on the buses. Bruce Morton talking about how it changed from the early days when he did it. Bruce Morton, now a national correspondent for CNN, covered the 1972 race, in which George McGovern waged an uphill battle to unseat President Richard Nixon. McGovern, I remember, was flying at some point in two little propeller planes, and we'd all swap around, so you'd, you'd spend you know, this leg with him, and the other guy would spend the next leg with him. The heat went out in one of them. We agreed the candidate ought to have the heated plane, as I recall. But, you know, you had, you had that kind of access. There is an endless cycle, a 24-hour cycle, in which somebody is always sticking a microphone in your face saying, I need to know right now I'm live. Well, of course, in another four years, it may be a virtual bus. I don't know. Uh, really, you may be able to do a lot of this on the Internet. Well, we call that one right about the Internet, and you sort of have the end of an era of political reporting with guys like Bruce Morton dying. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps, and tonight we're going to close with Jimmy Jamison, who died recently at the age of 63. He's best known as the lead singer of Survivor in the 1980s with his distinctive rock voice. Survivor was formed here in Chicago in the late 70s, and of course they came to prominence with their huge number one hit, the big song of 1982, Eye of the Tiger. Dave Bickler was the lead singer of Survivor then. He had to retire because of vocal problems, and Jimmy Jameson took over. And Jimmy Jameson did a couple of their later hits, and I'm going to play my favorites. They were written by two nice Chicago boys, nice Irish boy from Chicago, Frankie Sullivan, and Jim Peterick from Berlin, who might be the most underrated songwriter in rock music. Jim Peterick founded the Ides of March in the mid-60s. I still remember hearing Larry Lujak play Air A Good Feeling, which was Jim Peterick's first song for the Ides of March. And then they went on to be sort of the house band for My Pie Pizzeria on Sheridan Road back in the late 60s. But 10 years later, they were with Survivor, and 15 years later, they were writing songs like this for Jimmy Jameson. This was a top 20 hit in 1984 called I Can't Hold Back. Can you feel the hands of the fate? Reaching out to both of us This love of faith and grace I can't hold back I'm on the edge I can't hold back Turn my sex boat inside my head I can't hold back 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 Oh, it's too late to turn back this one's my favorite that Jimmy Jameson sang for Survivor. It was a top five hit. It's called High on You. I can't stop thinking about you, girl. I must be living in a fantasy world. I search the whole world over to find a heart so true. Such complete. And finally, to close, this is probably the song that showed off Jimmy Jameson's voice better than any other. It was another top five hit for Survivor. It's called The Search Is Over. I was living for a dream, looking for a moment, taking on the world that was just my style.